head into the Ringerverse to stay up to date with all things superheroes and nerd culture entertainment. Hosted by a rotating lineup of superfans at the Ringer, including Mallory Rubin and Van Lathan, shows will provide instant reactions to blockbuster releases, insightful backstories on canon, and mind-bending theories, as well as fresh takes on the latest news and rumors. Check out the Ringerverse on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRigger.com and joining me on the other line, live from Nazare, Portugal, it's Andy Greenwald. Tow me up, put me in a big wave. Once you go big, you can't go home, man. What's going on, Andy? It's Monday. We are here to chat about popular culture. We got a big show today. Uh, we're going to we? be talking about the new Matt Damon film, newish Matt Damon film, Stillwater, which we both watched this weekend. We're going to be talking, oh yes, about 100 Foot Wave, which we kind of dabbled in uh, mm-hmm. last week. And uh, Andy went on this journey with me. You know, it's been. It's been Surf City over in my house this summer. I just got done watching a Laird Hamilton documentary. <laughs> Riding Giants is next. Uh, so we're going to talk a little surf. And uh, we'll also, we can do some news at the top. How are you doing? Yeah. Oh, great, great. You know, I, I've reached the stage of my, I can't tell if it's my age, which is you know more or less our age, or my uh, physical regimen. <laughs> but I am now officially like, wow, that, really loud noise came from me as I stood up off the couch years old. Right. <laughs> and I do wonder, I mean, I know that I don't really do a good stretching regimen or whatever, but like with the amount that I'm going running in the world and then also like doing other things, like I, like yesterday I came back from a seven mile run and my family was like, let's go bike riding. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah bro, Ab- <laughs> absolutely. Like that's what I was made for. But then I also wonder then the flip side of it is will I ever stop hurting again? So, so that's my- I- it's funny you should bring this up because, you know, I've uh, I've been trying to get dialed out on the course again. I've been doing some rain sessions. And, He's talking about golf. And I've been trying to know. find my shot shape. Uh, I've been trying to... <laughs> Jesus uh, um, and, you know, like, I, I hadn't played in a couple of months. So right. when I got back out on the range, like, when I got home, because I, I didn't limber up, uh-huh. I hurt my back really bad. Like, it was oh, just no. incredibly painful. And yesterday, I was uh, on the couch um, and watching the BMW Championships, an incredible final round between matchup between Patrick Cantlay and Bryson DeChambeau. And I don't know if you know this about Patrick Cantlay or if you know who Patrick nope. Cantlay is. Never heard he, that name before. Uh, once fractured a vertebrae, a hairline fracture of his vertebrae, and now it takes him like five hours to like loosen up enough just to swing a golf club. Totally. And yesterday he played, I think, what it must have been like 25 holes uh, because they had like a six hole playoff. So he already needs to like warm up for five hours before he can play golf for five hours. And I'm just like, I can't hit 30 balls at the Griffith Park driving range without having to be in traction. So it really does put you like you have to understand to do things at our age. You now yes. really have to want to because you're going to pay for it. Yes. I mean, this is, this is, you asked me how I was doing on Friday and I was just like, well, Chris just had a, had an hour long Pilates session 
and I can't feel anything <laughs> south of my neck or north of my knees. Yeah. But <laughs> I assume that there's a goal. You know what I mean? Like, this yeah. is my version of, and this is going to come up again when we talk about big wave surfing, so buckle up. But I have to believe that there is a long-term purpose here. I just can't see it, right? So, so that's why we do the things we do. It's, is, it, is, it for, is it for televised greatness? Like the names of the golfers you mentioned whom I don't remember? Yeah, um, Patty no. Ice and, and the big golfer Bryson DeChambeau. No, but it's, it is to keep us limber and loose for the pop culture takes. That's right. That's that right. people want. That that's, people where want I, that's where I put in the work. That's where I lift. That's where I get, I get loose. You do, you, you do reps. I mean, that's, that's the true. other thing. Long-term fans of the podcast can probably tell days when you've already been in the gym slash sitting in front of the microphone for hours before you sit down with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit. Obviously, we're going to do uh, Stillwater. We're going to talk about 100-foot wave. But there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on today. First of all, yeah. you know, uh, lost a television legend this weekend, Ed Asner, who also yes. appeared in your show, Briar Patch. And I was just wondering if you'd like to share any remembrances of this giant of, I, of TV uh, with I our mean, listeners. There were a lot of people who listened during this time know, like, the entire experience was of making the TV show was totally surreal. But few things were more surreal than writing this part for an incredibly cranky old actor and our casting director, Susie Ferris, being like, well, what about Ed Asner? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, no, that's, when I say incredibly cranky old actor, like, that's obviously who I mean, but that's Lou Grant. Like, yeah, right. he's not, and... God bless Ed Asner. Like he was 89, I guess, at this point, or maybe 90. And he wanted to work. He loved to work. So he agreed to do the show, which was mind-blowing to me and to everyone else. I mean, like the, the other thing about working with a total legend like that is like Jay Ferguson was losing his mind. I get to have a scene with, with right. Lee Grant, which is he, he loved those shows in the Mary Tyler Moore show growing up. Or you have younger actors who know him from Elf or from The Voice in Up. And so he's just sort of this cross-generational legend. Or, or Rosario, who I think crossed paths with him, with him once at some sort of a political gathering because mm -hmm. he was incredibly dedicated and committed to left-wing political causes his entire life and really like, you know, walked the walk, didn't just talk the talk. But, he, you know, he also was a total crank and a, and a total character. He, early on when he agreed to do it, but before he arrived in Albuquerque, I got word that he wanted to, he wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh boy, okay. So I was like, <clears throat> you know, I got, I got ready. And I got on the phone with him. And it was pretty clear immediately that what he had probably conveyed is that he wanted to talk to the boss. Right. And so someone put me on the phone, but he wanted, he wanted Ishmael. He wanted Ishmael. <laughs> and then I realized he wanted Sam because he uh -huh. wanted to pitch Sam on something after he was done with Briar Patch. Oh, really? So I was like, oh, Mr. Asner, no problem. And, it's, and Sam was super geeked because then Ed Asner <laughs> wanted to talk to him and pitch him on something. But then when he showed up, you know, he just wanted to work and play. And he was partnered with the great actor David Paymer in all their scenes. And David Paymer was a great sport because they just, especially for their first scene in episode three, just kind of Statler and Waldorfed. And right. improv. So almost every line he has in that episode is, is improv. Were you uh, like Adam McKay, just like throwing lines from behind the camera, throwing jokes? You know, I, I couldn't tell how much he wanted me to exist, <laughs> let alone like be present that day. It was also like 100 degrees in Albuquerque. But the, my so, favorite so moment it was Albuquerque. Him, <laughs> it was Albuquerque. He, uh, I wrote a really, really long speech for him in episode seven. And he really wanted it. To, he was like, make it long. It's like, give me, give me, give me something. Give me something good. And I was like, yeah. And then also you're going to be yelling at Kim Dickens, calling her a cow and eating cottage cheese with a spork that's brought to you on a silver, under a silver cloche. And he was like, fine, that's, that's normal. That's fine. And this is the thing I shared on online it was my favorite memory of him was afterwards we took a picture and that was his last day of shooting. He was only in, I think three episodes. And, and he was like, how'd we do? And I was like, oh my God, Mr. Asner, like, I, I can't believe you did that scene. You were amazing. You know, said some stuff and he just did, looked me in the face and he went you uh you always just good at lying out your ass <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's who that dude was and i can't believe i got to work with him and i you know 91 years old and he was still working that was the other thing if you go on imdb like he just kept doing guest appearances and shows and he loved it, it he, you know, he really missed and it was an honor to work with him yeah i mean it's pretty amazing that uh obviously you got to make a show that's pretty amazing in and of itself but Thanks, the fact pal. that you did get to cross paths with 
you know, somebody of his stature and somebody with his sort of institutional gravity in terms of like what he accomplished over the course of his life and his career is pretty amazing. And my favorite moment when he came in after the last time I saw him, he had to come in to do some ADR because like to, to fix some some audio on some lines. So, you know, he, he his his uh, assistant wheeled him in because he was he could walk, but he was mostly traveling by wheelchair and, you know, put the headphones on him. And he's done this a thousand times and put the headphones on like, can you can you redo the cough here and say this line here? And he, you know, he nails it. And then when you do ADR, you're, you're speaking into a microphone along with the footage. And then the mm-hmm. footage continued to the next scene. And it was just my favorite moment. He was just like, ah, cough, get out of here, son, or whatever his line was. And then it switches to a different scene. And he just goes, well, look at the can on her. <laughs> so you know what I mean? <laughs> An old school, old school Hollywood guy way. to the end. You know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about one the most notable TV story that sort of has popped up over the last couple of mm-hmm. days because it's a show that you and I, I don't think either of us have watched uh, and we certainly haven't talked about, which is Manifest. It's uh, an NBC show. Writer's Room was next to the Briar Patch Writer's Room. Oh, okay. So, so clearly and, very connected to these guys. Right. And uh, this is a show that's been on for three seasons on NBC. Yep. Uh, it was announced, I think, last year that it was going to be canceled, that it was going not going to continue. Earlier this year. Earlier this year, seems like last year. Uh, and so they announced that it was going to not come back on NBC. There was a, as there is for many shows, a, a brief um, save manifest like like run where it's like they're talking to other streamers, they're talking to other networks, they're going to try and save it. it. A classic kind of like modern day TV story where you've got it, it's being aired on NBC, which has mm-hmm. its own streaming service. It's being made by Warner Brothers Television and it is doing very well. It's reruns, or not reruns, but its second run is having a huge amount of success on Netflix, according yep. to Netflix. Um, so the, the natural sort of landing place, if you will allow the pun for, for a show about a, a plane that goes up in the air and then lands five years later, was Netflix, because it was doing so well for that. But there, you know, there's all these complications. Netflix wants international rights. They had already sold the international rights for Manifest. Next, Netflix wants this. They had already kind of done that. And that's what happens when you have all these different cooks in the kitchen with a television show. And against all odds, they've sort of figured out all the the business side logistics of this deal, and are going to, in fact, bring Manifest back for a fourth season. Uh, Twenty episodes, so mm-hmm. it'll likely be broken up. I would imagine ten and ten, knowing Netflix, but maybe. There's some different order of the episodes because I would imagine for a show like that, especially since the viewers are probably anticipating this new season, they want to create some kind of sense of anticipation, which is, I think, Netflix's major issue with its original programming now is, Mm -hmm. you know, and what happens next week? And you can't get that. You can't get that because the diehards are just going to burn through it. And the conversation is going to kind of be all over the place. But this is a show with a really big fan community. What do you make of all this? Is this something that is sort of uh, like a curio or do you think it it means something more than just like they figured out a way to make the money work and this show found a landing spot? I think it is probably more that than anything else. And I think I, that's the specific piece of this that I can't really speak to because I don't really know what the money was or how it worked or what it means long term for the eventually four seasons of the show internationally, which you were right to point out is a, what drives a lot of Netflix's decision making. So in a way, I think this is kind of an old fashioned uh, event and almost mm-hmm. a throwback. The idea of a of an of one studio making a successful show for a broadcast network that finds a new finds life on an unaffiliated to the other two companies streaming service. Those days are coming to a halt. So in that sense, this is a very old media story. All the stuff that we remember from like I don't know twenty thirteen to twenty eighteen when it was like Netflix will give you another season, Netflix yeah. will save you. Right. That hasn't been happening much anymore. Um, precisely because of those reasons. I mean, because the real value is owning something and having it locked up in your catalog forever. And it's not just that Netflix wants to do it. It's that Warner Brothers wants to silo its content on HBO Max and NBC wants to silo its content on Peacock. So Mm -hmm. these worlds are becoming more and more separate. That said, I did think it was interesting and noteworthy because it's not as if Netflix is giving Manifest a new lease on life. They're giving Manifest a chance to finish the story. And I think that's the more interesting piece here. What they're doing is basically making a bet on having a absolutely established now in their own algorithms, bingeable, compelling show that is also done. That's the piece of it that is more contemporary Netflix. (laughs) That's very Netflix. You know what I mean? Like, as we've talked about, one of the reasons why, um, well, 
one of the reasons why I feel like we're not talking about Netflix as much as we were a few years ago, other than in business stories, is because the ongoing shows that they make that we like and support uh, are coming to ends, either ceremoniously or unceremoniously, in the case of um, Ozark and Glow, respectively. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the shows that they do make are much more, you know, closed circuit or international, right? Like a miniseries or... Um, they, you know, now we like call, like call your agent or call my agent or whatever seems to be doing very, very well for them. Um, yeah. as someone who watched until he couldn't anymore in season four, I don't think it's, it's not particularly like clickbaity. Like there's nothing for us to cover there other than it was delightful and it was a yeah. nice diversion. So, but I think that manifest speaks to something that, that has clearly proven to have value, which is that they have all of something that people want to go crazy for over a short period of time. And generally we've thought of that as they had 30 rock and people would just like go ham on it. Or, you know, I think I've told the story before about how Lily Amrapour, who directed the Briar Patch pilot, very avant-garde out there kind of visual mind, watched two episodes of Friends every night, no matter what, on Netflix. Yeah. Like that kind of completism. But the role of a show like Manifest is interesting to me and the deal makes sense for all involved. What it made me wonder is, they must be behind the scenes. But I guess I guess I was curious, maybe I'm not thinking of something, or maybe this is Cowboy Bebop, a show I don't really understand what it is yet. But why isn't Netflix more aggressively in the next lost business? Do you know what I mean? Like, if they I mean, could... I, I would imagine I mean, that dark, they would dark say... Dark was that. And, and I think Witcher you know, is okay. like kind of a next game of Thrones. So are you asking why they don't have like a water cooler show that's set it, in contemporary times or why they're doing such hard no, genre Specifically stuff? the Lost thing. Yeah, the, th the thing about Lost and Manifest and all those other shows over the last decade plus that the broadcast networks have tried and failed to, to, to hit with, like the event, you know, there are mm -hmm. always these like, light, not hard sci-fi, like There's soft sci-fi. There's a show, sci I think NBC has one now called Debris that's about like, right. you know, remnants of a UFO that start giving people powers or something like that. And, and that vibe has succeeded enormously in shows like Roswell, which I think is in its like 38th season on the CW right now. Mm -hmm. um, though that space doesn't really work in broadcast television because broadcast television model is, you know, we want to maximize this. So we want it to run for either one or 10 seasons, depending on what gives us the best return. But it's very hard to tell a multi-layered, complicated, forking story that way. Whereas if Netflix could say like, okay, you know, we're going to give you a five-year window to do it then they would have that five-year content chip in sure. their system. And that type of show has proven to be very successful. And I just, I don't even know, there probably is an internal industry name for a show like that. But I just feel like Netflix has been so smart and rapacious and being like, people sure do love watching makeover shows. We will make all of them. Mm -hmm. They sure do love making baking shows. We control all of them. Yeah. That this is a sign that this is really, this type of show Yeah, we have a huge footprint in the sports documentary world now. Right. We, you know, they, they've tried and then stopped seemingly making studio sitcoms, like basically, uh, yeah multicam sitcoms on sets. You know, I think that, that we talked about that a, a few months ago where it was interesting that they were seemingly getting out of that business. You know, um, I think that for something specifically like Manifest, from what I understand of it, and, and I understand like watching recap videos to get rid of this, right, ready for this podcast, but I would imagine that's something like that. That's your five like hour of golf swings, by the way. That, has that is a, impressive. That's right. It's me getting limbered. Uh, something like that must have a lot tied up in the week to week kind of conversation around an episode and where something is going up. It may have found its popularity because of binging and because people were like yeah. scrolling around on the main screen for, Oh yeah, let me check this out. Oh my God, I'm hooked. And there's three seasons of this to watch, but to do something new. Yeah. I do think that, you know, we've had this conversation in a hundred thousand different ways, but like does mayor of East town work on Netflix? If it's the same exact show, and then you wind up having, oh, well, I watched it yesterday, or we we loved it, we we crushed it in two days. But some people are like, hey, I'm finding this mayor of East Town show. Is that that's pretty good? I think you've I think you've nailed it on on two fronts. One is the delivery system and how it's appreciated and absorbed and enjoyed. But the other thing is just simply the risk. Netflix, mm -hmm. as a fundamentally as a tech company, is risk averse. They took big swings early to establish themselves, but now that they have success and algorithms and blah blah blah, they are risk averse. They're not going to take a, they're not going to make a reservation dogs, you know, and take a flyer on Sterling Harjo and 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 Taika's guidance and blah blah blah. It doesn't make sense for them to do that. The thing about Manifest is it, 
as I was just saying, you know, there, we have 10, 12 years of people trying to do a loss knockoff and mm-hmm. very few of them have worked. Some have had some uh, commercial acclaim or critical acclaim, but rarely both. And the thing about a show like that is it's a big bet. It's a big bet that you're going to have a show that has such a great question in this case. What happened to a plane for five years? And you don't know how long or how stretchable that concept is. So to your point, Netflix stepped in. Netflix would never have made that pilot, I guess is what I'm saying and what I'm right. realizing. What they want is, oh, it worked. And people want to watch it the way we can give it to them. So this works out for us. We can lay in wait. Let someone else, in this case, Warner Brothers and NBC, take the big bet and we ultimately end up winning. I think that's probably the the strategic decision making behind it and why they don't why they have an international division and a non-scripted division, but they division, but they don't have a soft sci-fi crowd pleasing open ended drama division. Yeah, and I wonder whether or not because if you start to think algorithmically, which I imagine Netflix obviously does, and I think you could make the argument to some extent Amazon does, although I sometimes feel like they have some of that older school studio sensibility mm-hmm. about the shows that they pick and the people that they want to be in business with. When you get into kind of atomizing their shows, if you think about Lost, Lost was a pretty diverse, relatively diverse cast. For the uh, time, yeah. And it was made with mass appeal in mind. You know what I mean? Like there's, there was even down to its genre influences, those things, like whether it was Flan o- O'Brien novels or, you know, the Bible or things that were baked into it, those things were so subterranean in its influences that really what you had was a ensemble drama with some with with a huge mystery. And when you look at something like say The Wilds which is on Amazon and is about a group of teenage girls going on a what they think is a retreat and then wind up being in a plane crash and and being stranded on a on an island seemingly in the South Pacific. That's like very specifically targeted to if not YA, but especially like teenage girls and people who think about like the sort of issues of teenage girls. Like it's, it's like almost a micro targeted advertisement within the show of like, we know exactly who we want to watch, who we want watching this show. And if we get other people, great, but this is going to have a baseline, like a, a floor of the people who buy these kinds of angsty adventure YA novels. And that's not really what the networks have ever kind of done. They've never been like, we're going to make a play for this sliver of an audience. And we think that that sliver is big enough. It's but a the really reverse is true. Netflix doesn't do that. Netflix doesn't make kind of generic dramas. And I think it's really, I think it's a good point that you made also about Amazon's role in this. What's, what's fascinating to me is Amazon and Netflix their scripted divisions are, I mean, the the org chart is different, but they're both more or less led by women who are veterans of NBC Universal, where Bella Bajaria ran Universal TV for many years and is now at Netflix. And Jennifer Salke is at Amazon. She ran, or was the number two, and then very high up at NBC for many years. I thought it was interesting the other day at the upfronts, you know, where the executives present their slate, I guess, still virtually to, to, to the media, to journalists, that Jen Salke from Amazon was like, yeah, I regret missing out on Mayor of Easttown. Meaning Amazon mm-hmm. was bidding for that show. Yeah. Which I thought was, I thought that in itself was kind of noteworthy, noteworthy and interesting. You know, feel free, uh, Brad Inglesby, to call back into our show anytime, or, or Kate, because I assume she's still listening, and tell us I'm wrong. But I, Net, I bet Netflix didn't bid on it because I don't see what it does for them, right? But- and we very much know what it does for HBO. It's been huge. It's driven subscriptions to HBO Max. It's burnished its brand as the the place for week to week conversational TV and like awards bait, et cetera, et cetera. Amazon, I guess, still maybe it's because its business remains all of the rest of what it does. Its TV department is still kind of being well. I guess it's being run a little bit like both, right? Mm-hmm. It has the we talked about this the other week. They're like half a billion dollars for all the sci fi stuff, but uh, here, we wish we could have given you this, you know, this prestige crime procedural. And also, um, Donald Glover and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, like, yeah. this is your creative home. Um, We're going to do another kinda, season of Modern Love. You know, yeah, exactly. Kind, yeah. Of caught, kind of caught between them. And uh, I guess all of this is to say our understanding of what Netflix is in terms of a creative entity still very much in flux. Yeah, that's a good place to stop. Why don't we take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about Stillwater and uh, 100 Foot Wave. The opposite of Stillwater. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun. 
the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, man, we are back. Uh, Andy, it's been a long time, I feel like, since we talked about a new movie that wasn't like a Marvel thing or, or, or like, you know, kind of like a blockbuster genre thing. It, this is like a, in a lot of ways, a throwback to the kind of movies that you and I grew up watching in, in the 90s. Uh, it is a film from Tom McCarthy starring Matt Damon and Call My Agents, Camille Cotton. And it is uh, a new a, a film set in both Oklahoma and Marseille. I think people are probably pretty familiar with the setup by now, mostly because this movie has gonna not gotten what I would call great press uh, in yeah. terms of both its relationship to the Amanda Knox story and also some of the reviews. And it was interesting to go into watching this film with that in mind. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about my own sort of sense of expectations about things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you get out of the window of this better be fucking good because movies are dying, like you wind up actually maybe greeting things a little bit on its own terms. Um, I've been thinking about that with a couple of movies that I've been sort of just kind of going back to on cable when I'm just like sitting around while sports aren't on. But for this one, I went into this and, and you know, I was like, I expected to sort of be, I don't know, uh, disappointed by this movie. And I'm having like a very, very, very strange reaction to it, hmm. which is essentially that I don't know. And that we're going to talk about this film with spoilers. So if you haven't seen, um, if you haven't seen Stillwater, by all means, skip ahead to the hundred foot wave, or go have a lovely Monday afternoon, or, or go safely to a theater or rent it at home. Yes, you can, yeah, you can watch it at home. That's where both of us watched it. Um, what do you do when you pretty much love something mm-hmm. <laughs> for two thirds of it? Yeah, and the last third is so flawed that it makes you go back and revisit, like re, basically reconsider everything that you saw up into the final 15 to 20 minutes of the movie. Maybe 30. Totally. Well, so let, let me, before answering that, just so people who aren't familiar, Matt Damon plays a, uh, a roughneck from Oklahoma who's traveling mm-hmm. to Marseille because his uh, college-age daughter has been imprisoned there for murdering her roommate. Uh, he becomes involved in a sort of quixotic, ill-advised potentially quest to f- free her name, but the movie goes in some, into some surprising directions from there. Very surprising. Um, I, before beginning, I don't know if I entirely agree with you, but I also completely understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I don't know if this is even, if it, is this a paternalistic way to like view movie or culture? But I enjoyed this and the experience of watching it so much. And I think one of the reasons that I did is not just because I think Tom McCarthy is a really just excellent humanistic filmmaker. I, I, you know, Spotlight is his best known movie, but I love The Station Agent and I especially love a movie he made called The Visitor with Richard Jenkins. I really mm-hmm. think people should check it out. Um, he made Win Win too, right? And he made Win Win, another terrific sort of small quote unquote movie. What I really, there are two things that I deeply loved and admired about this movie before we even get into like, I think Matt Damon is just blacks out. I think he's so good in this. I think there's so many specific things we can talk about. But The way that I was appreciating the movie, just whole cloth, is I think that it tries to do something so, so, so hard. And it takes something that I think most rational-minded, creative people almost want to run away from, which is, let's make a movie about talking to red state America or red hat America. Hmm. Let's make a movie about America's role in the world in the Trump era or after the Trump era. Let's Let's try this and let's also try to give it, you know, some stakes and, uh, you know, stuff that make it a movie and also keep it within the relatively reduced um, purview of what Tom McCarthy's interested in, which is human beings behaving like human beings. He doesn't do, this isn't taken, right? Sure. And what struck me again and again in watching the movie is that it was such a good faith effort to do that. I don't mean to say that I'm grading the movie on a curve, but I felt that it, admirably and honestly wrestled with 
who it wanted its characters to be, what they represented, what they portrayed, ways to upend that, and to try to get at something that is very uncomfortable to think about or talk about, I think, for a lot of us at the moment. And that is what, I, you know, not to sound super corny, but I feel like that's what movies are supposed to do. And I found that very, I, I was very inspired by that. And the second piece of that, just from a purely structural level, listen, Chris, you you know Nobody loves Letterboxd more than me. You know what I mean? Like, I am a cinephile with a capital uh, cine. Sure. Like, that's just me. Um, <laughs> your username so, is Lord of the Skies, where you do exact, most of your cinema watching. Yeah, It is. <laughs> it is, yeah. I, the smaller I do better, the screen, the better, baby. <laughs> the, the higher the elevation and the higher the blood alcohol level, the more I will love uh, feature films. But one thing that I have been enjoying over the last year and we've talked about this a little bit, as I've been doing a lot of like Criterion Channel crushing and enjoying movies, really loving the movies that I've been seeing and looking backwards and exploring a lot of classic films, et cetera. And one of the things that I love about them is I just think that fundamentally they're so different than TV shows. And maybe this is the, the TV writing part of me that is taking refuge in movies is, you know, they have to be broader because you can't digress into this person's subplot or the character or the arc character arc or the season that's about this. You have to tell the, choose the stakes for your story and then execute at such a high level because you're doing the beginning, middle, and end. And w when I say that, it sounds like I'm saying I like movies because they're predictable, but not like in a Robert McKee screenwriting convention, don't save the cat kind of thing. It's just that, well, we're running out of time. So now we have to do this turn and this twist. And this is the movie we're going to say. So the re this is the movie we're trying to make. What I loved about Stillwater on top of everything else was this movie did not go to the beat of any other drummer. This movie does not follow yeah. anything close to a linear path. It zigs and zags and becomes three or four different movies in a way that I think is incredibly difficult to pull off. And I think it almost pulled off. Yeah. And, and, and I loved that it was a movie, not a TV show. That the moment when like the humanization of our lead where he sort of has this idol in France and becomes a different person and it's romantic and sweet and family-centered and fun. Like, that wasn't a bottle episode. That was still in this relatively tight two-hour movie. And I loved the I loved the looseness in something that is normally so tight. So you 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 go into this movie and and there like what Andy is describing is essentially like I think the middle act of this film mm -hmm. turns into Damon's character, Bill Baker, uh falling in with and then falling in love with Camille Cotton's character, Virginie. So this is a, this uh, single mother who's a, a theater actress with a daughter named Maya and they live in an apartment in Marseille and through like happenstance, like he kind of meets them. Then they, then she helps him out with the sort of initial stages of the investigation or his, his own investigation into who may have actually killed this, this character, Lena. And then there's something that happens in the middle of the movie where he basically takes like a, a, a long break from interacting with his daughter. And he pretty much just starts a surrogate family with Virginie and Maya. And there is like a whole episode of this, of this movie, which is just basically like his day to day of, he has a construction job and like, this is what he does at his construction job. But then he goes home and he makes hamburgers and, uh, he's a babysitter. To, yeah. He's, but he's, There's, he's becoming a, he's found a family and he's not only found a family. I think he's like, the thing that I loved about the movie was that there was no false transformation of a character. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not yes. like he gets to the end of the movie and he's now all of a sudden, like, reading Sartre or, you know, going to see Brecht plays or, you know, conversing with people in a cafe. He's still a roughneck, but I think he had a part of his heart, like, opened up because yep. he got to experience a different kind of life than he had lived up until then. And it's a guy who's got addiction issues and rage issues. But essentially, like, I thought that that whole part of the movie was brilliant. And the reason why I think you're reacting to it being like, oh, this was, this was so refreshingly a movie is because McCarthy is a very good writer. And so much of the exposition in this movie is so economically doled out. Like, there's a moment early in the film when they're still in Oklahoma and Bill goes to uh, an older woman named Sharon's house. And he just goes and has dinner and they have, like, an exchange. And you find out that Bill doesn't really talk to his own mother. You find out that Sharon, who's uh, Allison's grandmother, it's his mother-in-law. And you just wind up learning so much about this family in a really natural, 
very real feeling conversation between these two people without it ever being like, let's do a data dump. Let's do a reading of resumes. Let's do a reading of family history. I just thought that was remarkable. And that gets repeated multiple times throughout mm-hmm. the film where you find out all this stuff about Camille Catan's family or her her life and what her relationship to the father of her child is and what she thinks about theater. But it all feels very much like it's emanating from a very lived in natural place. No more so than the film's capturing of fucking Marseille, which is unbelievable. It is an unbelievably transporting movie. And you, I I mean, obviously travel has been pretty limited, but like to be that immersed in a city, which frankly does not get enough time on screen in, in cinema or in TV, because it's so evocative. It's so interesting to look at. So textual that I, I just found myself really, really falling in love with the people and the place and the story and everything. And I was really, really caught up in it. And then it has this, this third act that I think most people are having a hard time wrapping their minds around. I think, I, I love what you're saying about the way, I mean, Tom McCarthy, I think the thing that I find compelling about him is that he just really loves people and he loves people talking. And to listen to him, listen to him on some other interviews and other podcasts, and he does have a process. I mean, he does almost rep- reportage. Like he does go, he wants to go to Oklahoma and talks to people. You know, he didn't feel like he was capturing Marseille correctly, so he brought on some French collaborators to work on the screenplay. People who had worked with uh, the director Jacques Odiard, who we've talked about recently From in his bureau, role yeah. of finishing the bureau. I think that that's just an underrepresented style of filmmaking in general, and I always really get excited about it. I think that he and Matt Damon really committed to creating a whole person, uh, which is challenging about someone who in many ways could be a walking stereotype, doubly so when walking around France in his in his jeans and his trucker cap. Um, but to your point, someone who has depth and mm-hmm. um, pain, you know, uh, and also a way of being that it's easy to be, you know, sitting on the coast and be judgmental about, but also the performance and the writing and the filmmaking allows us a, a window, right? Which I think is the, what storytelling does at, it, at its best. I think ultimately the reason why, and and I, even without, I know we're going to talk about the whole movie, we could talk about the specific choices at the end where Bill takes certain actions that result in what he thought he wanted happening, but maybe mm-hmm. not to the way that he thought. It doesn't go the way he thought. The thing that I can't get over about the movie that I found really impactful was what it kind of had to say about American exceptionalism and not necessarily in the way that we normally see it. Because the one constant that you really, well, the one thing that you learn about Bill is that we see his existence and the pain that he's gone through and the sort of furrow he's worked himself into, just working the same sorts of jobs and then eating, you know, takeout hot dogs or Subway sandwiches and sleeping on his couch watching TV and waking up again. And the thing about living in the middle of a country like America is you can do that. It's not saying it's a choice, That's but but the exceptional ability to just be barricaded in this place, basically. Mm -hmm. And then when he goes to Marseille and is opened up to so many other things, and then there's the sort of extrajudicial aspect of it. It's not just the American cowboy thing, but that literally he justice is changed, right? Whether, and it's ambiguous about how we should feel about that, but all of this stuff that can happen over there, it's undone in a very American way. And then at the end of it, he's back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what did he learn? What did he gain from it? What's still out there? That, that sense of being closed off here. Yeah. I mean, the the, the way to put a bow on it would, would be to say like, he gets everything he thought he wanted and lost everything he actually needed. You know, life, he, life is brutal, as they say in the movie. Yeah, and they, they it's said twice. You know, once by Allison in the middle of the movie, mm-hmm. when she's experiencing this one moment of freedom and is thinking she probably won't, you know, ever get like really ever get back her life, and then again by Bill at the end of the movie after he has, you know, just avoided going to jail himself and has pulled some really questionable shit, he is almost saying life is brutal wistfully like he's saying that like i think i'm opening myself up to the like possibility of happiness and the also attendant heartbreak or disappointment that goes along with losing something that made Mm -hmm. you happy uh and you know i mean that that i thought that the very final scene of the movie was quite moving um does this feel old-fashioned to you that we're talking about 
a movie that may or may not have quote unquote stuck the landing that may not that, that absolutely without question isn't a masterpiece. I mean it's not it's not perfect. It's not mm-hmm. all good even, but that you know there's there's it's rich enough to have a conversation like that. I think it, this idea that it needs to get it right or it needs to, you know, be correct about everything whether it's it's plotting or its view of Americans or etc, you know, it, it's such an exhausting it's such an exhausting way to to to, to filter the stuff. So I'm, I'm I'm just relishing that we both watched this like a few weeks after. I mean, it wasn't really in the spotlight, but a few weeks after it came out, and there's just a lot to unpack here. Yeah, I I think that I mean, should we talk about the the sort of last act? I mean, because we we kind yeah, of sure. yeah. I mean, we could just I th- maybe just think a lot about manipulation. So over the course of the movie, especially in the second act. Bill develops this very close relationship with this kid, Maya, Virginia's daughter, Maya. They have like this really adorable relationship where she's teaching him French words and he's teaching her English words and he picks her up every day after school and helps her with her homework. And it's just... She likes ketchup now. It's it's quite touching, honestly. And the kind of movie turns when they go to a Marseille football match. Incredible. They shot it at the velodrome. It's I just wanted to fucking ask you about that. electric. And... He sees this guy who he believes is the actual killer of this girl, Lena, who is mm-hmm. his daughter is currently serving time for for having uh, murdered. And he endangers Maya quite a bit in his pursuit of this guy. Yeah. And goes on to kidnap him and keep him in a basement uh, in the building where he lives with Virginia and, and, and Maya. And I could just feel like the the like temperature change in the room when I watch when I was watching that like both I was watching with my wife Phoebe we were both just like what the fuck but not like what the fuck in a this is so Hitchcockian like this is so interesting and, and gripping full, full disclosure my wife got up and left at that point and right. did not finish the movie because she was like this is revolting or what it was the kid endangerment sure you know and and I was very uncomfortable with that turn at the moment I then thought more about it after watching the movie and I was like this movie isn't that movie but the fact that in retrospect, this was not a movie that was about putting the child in physical jeopardy. It was more about the emotional, you know, choices that he was making, et cetera, and the effect that it would have later, blah, blah, blah. It's probably a flaw of the filmmaking that all of our minds went to that place. That it well, had, I guess it it's also jumped the rails a little bit. It's a question about, you know, when you're watching a movie character, I think you take your omniscient. You know, whenever that character is on screen, you get to see everything. Yeah. So you think that you know this person by a certain point in the movie. I'm just speaking from a perspective of the audience. And then when you see them do something, not only that like is horrifying, but is also like really disorienting to your orientation towards the character. You know, you're like, I know that this guy isn't perfect. And I know that this guy probably has like some rugged shit from his past. Mm -hmm. But it seems strange that he would do this even if it meant like losing his sight of this guy. You know what I mean? Like it seems mm-hmm. like the extremity and the sort of almost pulpy nature of it, I guess in s- some ways, maybe Tom McCarthy would say it is pulpy. It is kind of a little bit of a crime thriller at the end there. That's the turn I wanted to make. I wanted to give it a kind of uh, a, sh- a jolt of electricity and uncertainty because otherwise it would be a fairy tale. It would be like this, you know, it would be Beauty and the Beast in Marseille and this guy finds like a second life and, you know, I, I don't really know what the the resolution would have been otherwise, but there was something about the nature of what he does and then the way that it kind of is, you know, I, I, and I know this guy just makes a lot of mistakes and he's always trying to sort of dig himself out of trouble throughout his life, but it's something about it really rang false to me. I think the thing that I, I kept coming back to was what the movie was suggesting about the bonds or the, the um, yeah, I mean, like the, the bonds that can almost feel like, like, like chains that can drag us down, you know, and his constant belief that he needed to atone for things and make up for things and be the father that he wasn't to Allison and thus have a relationship with Allison that he couldn't and thus fix something for her, right? Like that's baked into who the character is when he first shows up and gives the lawyer the letter and then they leave it alone. But he tells Allison that it's all going great. In that moment, it's this kind of awful thing where he kind of chooses nature over nurture, right? Like he chooses this quixotic quest to like fix his birth daughter's relationship and sacrifices his chance to get it right. 
you know, his happier relationship for it. The actual plot was supporting that emotional turn. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you that it it it's a it's a leap. It's a leap. And, you know, and there are a number of them in the movie. I mean, you have to accept that he just fundamentally will never involve the police, even though time and time again, it seems like that would help Allison sure. if you were to do that. You kind of have to believe that he's going to just see one person in a crowd of 70,000 at a <laughs> soccer match, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's there are a lot of things that do. It, it, it is one of those things where, and this is often the case, I think, where something is very ambitious thematically and wants to be about something that once those dots are set in the firmament, like like in the sorry in the firmament in the sky, like stars, then connecting them becomes it can it can stretch it can sure. pull. So so sure. the, the 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 TikTok of the story does start to come apart despite a lot of work on it. I agree with you, um, and there's no question that when that moment happens, I was like I started to lean out instead of lean in. Mm-hmm. But then it gets to a place like you were saying in the last moment, we're like, oh okay, I see what this was for and what yeah. it's worth. And, and I mean, Damon, man, Damon's yeah. so good. Yeah, I mean, I Sean and Amanda had a, a, a short chat about about this movie on on their pod on Thursday, on Friday, and and I thought, you know, they didn't really get too into the details of it, but they talked about some of their difficulty, sort of just being like, that's Jason Bourne, like it's just yes. really hard to get over it. And there is a fight scene where I was just like, he's going to kill all these guys. And he, he didn't like, have any him, magazines. It was like him versus 11 dudes. And I was like, these dudes are in trouble. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I think it's, um, it's a remarkable performance. And I think specifically it's remarkable because they never give this guy a moment where all of a sudden, like there's this flowering of intellect or this outpouring no, of emotion. Like he always keeps it in. There's just a moment when like, Virginia makes like a casserole with tomatoes and he eats that instead of a hamburger and you're like, right. oh my God, anything is possible. We can all change. <laughs> That's right. La- this, this might be the only Venn diagram. The Venn diagram of this point observation might only be our podcast, but it was a little trippy to watch Stillwater the same weekend I finished the Netflix series, The Chair, both of which are about, um, you know, pill, either in the past or present, pill popping <laughs> troubled white men named Bill who uh-huh. develop very intense and beautiful babysitter <laughs> relationships with single mom's daughters. Uh-huh. Um, th- that's true of both of those works. And it's those are probably the best parts right. of both of them. And that was a little, that was a little confusing at times. Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought you were going to say like the, 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 the Chris Ryan, like the ward movement is really moving, is like, oh, it's really happening. You see yourself in the bills. <laughs> that's nice. You know, if, if you ever want to, take my younger daughter out for hamburgers. Like you are welcome. It's a different direction than what we've been describing, which has really been more of like a, you know, like a Hoosiers type thing. Uh-huh. That's not exactly what I'm offering you. But if you'd like to have something more similar to what we're talking about. Right. Just um, as long as I stay away from any extra d- judicial investigations. And circuit breakers. Like yeah. I don't <laughs> think that you should necessarily be redoing the electrical grid in my home. Sure. But otherwise, if you just want to like figure out different words for hammers and screwdrivers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, let's talk about hundred foot wave. Yes. So I got to talk a little bit about this, obviously at length with you before. So I want you to lead this one. This has been like a real revelation for me. Just like this, like late summer burst of interest in surfing. I've got (laughs) barbarian days over here. I'm, I'm just like really jumping in with two feet. I'm so happy that you loved this show. Tell me or show series. Uh, tell me a little bit about about what you were thinking as you were going through the rest of these these episodes. I'm so grateful to you for making this recommendation. Be grateful to Phoebe. She was the one who found it. I'm always grateful to Phoebe. Um, th- I loved this so much, and it was exactly what I needed. And I loved it in ways that totally surprised me. I also think, and we can talk about this, you and I have both seen the entirety of the series. It's actually now the entirety of the first season, because they're going to bring the show back, um, which will be, you know, which is worth discussing. In many ways, it, it it's it's multiple shows in one mm-hmm. because in the first two episodes, you know, it, there's so much, it's not, it's recent history, but it's still history. Like I did not understand the difference between paddle surfing and toe surfing and the stakes that have been raised with big waves and who these character cast of characters were. And then sort of getting up almost to the present day, learning about this place, Nazare and Portugal and what it means and how the communities embrace it or not. And then there's the middle episodes, which are just about people getting fucking broken yeah. and crushed. Yes. And then in the end, it's kind of just like a almost cinema verite documentary because every second of these people's lives have been filmed. And it takes us right up to 
almost last month, and it's like pandemic-y. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, now I see that this is the bones of a series about these very interesting, again, broken in some senses characters seeking this kind of spiritual and athletic redemption. So it's many things at once. But I want to start by saying, I felt the most intense, kinship isn't the word, because <laughs> while I have recently made the change in my life that I am now someone who jumps into swimming pools and doesn't just sort of dick around on the steps for a while being like, ooh, that's cold. Yeah. And I feel like in that sense, I am not unlike CJ, his first time in Nazare, who's just like, sure, bro, tow me up. Like, I do think that we have that in, in ourselves. <laughs> yes. Um, I did text you like 45 minutes into the first episode with, you know, I don't usually like to, to make uh, assertions without evidence. I mean, this is a very fact-based podcast, but yeah. I feel confident when I you say- You also give things a fair shot. Like you're always, always. like, I'm going to wait till I get to the, the end The whole of this. thing. <laughs> yeah. Who am I to jump in now? Uh, unless it's swim a swimming pool, in which case I will jump in. Um, I think there never has been and there never will be a Jewish big wave surfer. I feel very <laughs> confident in that. Just culturally, neurotically, everything in my body is screaming. That's just not, not possible. And that I think ultimately is why I love this so much. Because, I, I mean, I don't even know how deep we're going to get in, in the ocean here. But, like, just purely on a spiritual slash emotional level, for these people to be like, yep, take me into that red spot on the right. satellite map with a jet ski, and I will let go of the rope, and I will do that. I, it really resonated with me. I found it really compelling Obviously, it's beautiful to look at, but I found it really, really moving. Yeah, you know, so there's so many things that I loved about this. One of it was just, it's it's obviously filmed over the course of about 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that they start, basically, the footage starts in 2011. So you get to see the characters age, and you get to see them go through some pretty significant life changes. Like we said before, Chris Smith, who made American Movie and worked on Tiger King, is the director of this. And, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of how they acquired all this footage or whether he shot all of it or some of it was self-produced by the McNamara family, which is the I think, sort of I think central. it's more likely that, yeah. Yeah, and they have footage of basically everything from the start of 2011 to through the pandemic in 2020 20, or 21. And so you kind of see not only this guy, Garrett, who even when the movie starts or the show starts, he's a he's aging. He's an aging surfer. To now, when you're like, this is a bad idea for you to do this, man. Like, you have kids, and you've you've suffered some really, really, really scary injuries. And, and you can tell. you're in your mid-50s. But you can tell that it's like, there's all, like, existence is not as, like, technicolor when he is not out on that wave. And you, they do a really good job of somehow communicating what that must be, that experience must be like, is if if you are the, somebody who can tame the untamable or mm -hmm. can survive the unsurvivable, that then like barbecues and ball games to steal something from heat just don't really hit, they hit different, you know, like you, and over and over again, you see this guy be like, you know, I really, I, you know, I've been told like, if I screw this up again, I won't be able to walk anymore. Or like my mm -hmm. shoulder almost just got like shredded. I really have to think about life. Like I have a kids now and me and Nicole and, and then like 10 minutes later, he's just like, I saw that fucking wave and I'm just like, I'm, I'm, it, I'm about to get out there. It's again, this might be, this is probably on some level, whether it was conscious or not, why we began our show today talking about how our aging bodies hurt, <laughs> but there's something that is very, very compelling about the fact that the protagonists of this are not the young bucks. Uh -huh. Late in the series, you meet people who, I guess if you're a surfing fan, you would know about, and there would be household names, like the guy Kai Lenny, you know, like these mm -hmm. young kids who suddenly show up in Nazare, and they are literally doing video game things. Like, our understanding as a complete person like who doesn't... They're doing flips and 360s, yeah. yeah. On the waves that up to now, as someone who'd never heard about any of this, I see, you know, Garrett do this wave, or Justine, or some of the other people that we've we've met at this point, and it just seems like just getting on it and riding it to completion feels Herculean. Mm -hmm. These younger guys get on it, and they're just doing like sick three sixties, like they're playing Cool Borders on their PlayStation, like it's nothing, and that is awesome to look at. But what's more fascinating and, and, and just resonates on such a deeper level is just Garrett's lifelong quest to have this. Zen communion with the impossible. And mm -hmm. 
Cotty, who becomes, you know, either the second or third most compelling character in the show, depending on your power rankings, which we should get into, you know, just seems like the, the, the most charming, lovable English guy who also has a family at home. And we meet him when he's just like some young kid who's like, I can't believe Garrett McNamara wants me to drive a jet ski. Tow him out him. until the middle and of- And it's only because yeah. we were in Ireland and England and we were nearby to being a grizzled veteran himself who had broken his back there. Mm-hmm. And we feel the pathos of it. He's still getting something from this, but the effort and the training yeah. and then just the That the whole lack portrait of, of Cotty is amazing because he basically starts as like Garrett's assistant. Padawan, yeah. And then right when he would sort of naturally kind of ascend in that whole world, he gets mm-hmm. A, very badly injured, and also B, the entire world wakes up to the possibilities of Nazare. And so you start getting all these people coming in and there's obviously growing pains with that, which is incredible. Like when, when they're like, yo, like the safety precautions aren't right here or like guys are just like kind of doing it without the proper training. But it's almost as if the surfing community passes Cotty by a little bit yep. because you've got these guys like Kai who are like, I can just grind this out. Like I'm just like, he's basically like Tiger Woods of surfing. And Cotty's like, fuck man. Like I would love to get I would love to get like some recognition, some accolade, some one time in the spotlight. And he's either either been in Garrett's shadow or the shadow of the guys who come after Garrett. Oh, hey, the one time he won anything, it was for the wipeout that broke his back. Right. Which he right. has to carry around like an albatross because that's what people remember him They're for. They're like, oh, yeah, you're you the know? guy who did this. Yeah, right, right. It, and, and then, because <laughs> I need to go here, my favorite television character of 2021 is CJ. So... For, you know, I think people know, but we'll just go over it briefly. Like, Garrett has already had a career as a surfer, retired, learned about tow surfing, which in which he is, you know, you don't paddle out, you are towed via jet ski out to the really, really big waves behind the what previously had been the big waves, and becomes this almost like, you know, monk kamikaze pilot of these waves. He also then falls in love with his second wife, starts a new family eventually. This is a, a woman named Nicole. Mm-hmm. You and I are big fans of Nicole great arc throughout the series and she's just with him in Portugal uh, as they build this and she's his manager and they build this whole new identity around this whole new surf spot together. Um, Early on, we also meet Nicole's brother. Yeah. CJ. Yep. And I just like, (laughs) again, I don't even know how to, like I have a cousin whom I love very much and she married a wonderful guy who's a goy from Long Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my favorite family members are him and his family. Okay. They are, could not be less like me. And that's why I love them so much. Like his dad is a pipe fitter his whole life, has a framed picture in his kitchen, framed like etching. And it says, it is what it is. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. Was I've this lived before my whole or after life. the Irishman? Uh, years, years, decades. And I'm like, no Jewish family has ever said it is what it is. Because it never right. is. It's right. always more. So there is something, I don't mean to be like, belitt- like I just find that very beautiful and inspiring and as alien as watching uh, a science fiction movie to me. And so CJ, there's this moment where they're like, we're in Portugal. And so we called CJ. Okay, what was CJ doing, her kid brother? Well, he was playing professional beach volleyball right. elsewhere in Europe. And he came down to Nazareth. In like, in like Malaga, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, in Spain. No one else is there at this point, but these are already to their eyes and the camera crews, uh, now our eyes, the biggest waves that have ever been seen on planet Earth. And <laughs> CJ's not even yet brother-in-law, Garrett's like, bro, let me tow you out and you can rip some or whatever. Yeah. CJ's like, Bet, sick, let's do it. And he does it. And then his whole arc later is like years later when it's time to like compete and Garrett, and I can't tell if this is legit or not. And Garrett's like, CJ could be among the best in the world if he wanted to be. He doesn't want to be. No. Because he's trying to get his body and mind right. And so instead of going to the Nazare Championship, he goes to Peru for two weeks in search of, quote, natural medicine, yeah. which means cramming into a tent and throwing up into a bucket. <laughs> this guy is my fucking Lord. Yes. I just love him. I love his beautiful spirit and energy. I will never, ever know what it's like to be him, but I wish I could just know a little bit. I just admire him and I love him. Yeah, CJ is really a great character. That's the thing is that this show just has like so many indelible characters. I mean, like Cotty, like Al Meni, who's the the uh, the other <laughs> sort of first surfer that goes out with Garrett. Uh, he's from He's from Ireland. It's just awesome. Yeah. So you think that this, so there's going to be more, huh? 
200 foot wave, baby. Yeah. No, they are making a second series. I mean, again, they, I, I appreciate and respect the way this the show is made because there's a section, I think it's in the fifth episode, where they talk about how professional surfing doesn't exist if, unless there are surf photographers and cameramen, right, to, to tell the story. And that's kind of the tension that probably exists in the minds and the abnormally large necks of all these successful surfers, which is, am I doing this because I love this moment of communion and it's a very private moment? Like, as Garrett says multiple times, he wishes he could just go out and de- rip these sets, right? Like, he just wants to be doing it. And there must be tons of times where he did, where they weren't being watched or competing. But none of that matters in terms of livelihood or... Yeah sponsorships or the way they make their money are able to do this. So this 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 collision between like what what they want to be doing and then what we see, all this is to say every moment of their lives has been filmed for the last, you know, certainly three years and clearly for longer. So they must just have more footage. And so what's what the, what it's interesting to watch the show pivot almost from being a spiritual journey of one man mm-hmm. versus one wave to here's the cast of characters of big wave surfing. Yes. Here we go. You know, I just want to end on one note that I had about you know, my favorite, one of my favorite parts about this series is the, the domestic snapshots we get of these people's right. lives. Totally. And, um, you know, at the end, they're kind of like, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and you're like, well, that was tough for everybody, you know? And then yeah. it's like cut to incredible drone shot as we come in on Garrett's like dope Oahu estate. And like Nicole is making like sweet potatoes and it's just like, yeah, it's been real challenge being uh, cooped up here. And like CJ is out greeting, greeting the day, like inhaling the sea foam. And like all these kids are like paddle boating around at like toddler age. And I'm like, you had a much different pandemic than I did. Chickens are running into their house. Yeah. Also, like, I just can't understand if you have that kind of a Wahoo pad. I like Portugal a lot when I went. I liked it. But looks like beautiful. Nazare looks like a small Portuguese fishing village. And yeah. it also looks like it's winter 10 and a half months of the year there. It is like <laughs> up in the North Atlantic. Yeah. So it's just sort of wild when you were like, oh, yeah, you know, I could uh, I could just go out and catch these two yeah. or three footers in Oahu and then come back and like yes. eat Nicole's Be- cooking and chill. Because the footage, and we should say this, I mean, it's a beautiful thing to look at. This it's whole amazing. series and it's what Philip your new Glass TVs music, were made for. Yeah. It's such a well done production. That said... It jumps up a level almost without doing anything different when they're in Oahu. I'm like, oh, this is what Technicolor must have felt like when black and white movies cease to be a thing. Like, it is so vibrant and electric and beautiful and great. And yeah, like, I'd like that life. But maybe that's another piece of it that I think it it makes the show so compelling, which is something keeps getting them out of there. Something keeps motivating them to leave paradise. I will say in the case of CJ, he brings some of that sweet, sweet paradise attitude with him wherever he goes. And I hope he could bless me one day. I mean, I would I would sign up for that yoga class. And what, what, there's, an ep- there's just a moment in one episode where he's leading a laughter yoga class. <laughs> yeah. He's like, we have to we have to laugh out all of our trauma. I mean, OK. <laughs> sounds, sounds, <laughs> also, sounds, someone something Jewish people don't say. <laughs> d- d- no, we we laugh about it, but it's, it, it doesn't come out. It right? doesn't it get stays, anywhere. Yeah, it, it's it stays like a- it's, it stays within. <laughs> Last question I have for you is people who know, you know, who listen to this podcast for years. No, we don't generally dabble in nonfiction programming. That's not Top Chef. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we talked about like the Jinx, which was a I watched Survivor, show a couple yeah. years ago. And you watch Survivor. But I mean, in terms of like documentary docuseries. Mm hmm. Is this one particularly unique because of the subject matter in that every single moment is filmed? I mean, my memory of watching documentaries or my experience watching documentaries, even expert ones like The Last Dance, which I enjoyed earlier this year, there will be moments when someone narrates something because, of course, a camera wasn't turned on. Well, they don't. Ha- but- there's a couple of things that they don't have. Like, they don't have Al and Cotty's, like, falling out, right? That's right. And I feel like there is some stuff that's, like... I don't know. There's some domestic stuff that I think gets skipped over a little bit, but you mean like I, Garrett's first first family that we to never me meet? it's just like they do a very effective job of being. They have something that like no other documentary seems to have, which is like we can always cut to these big waves and they're dope. You know, yeah. like there are it's some so shows dope. they were just like, oh, I got to do a drone shot. Like here's another flyover of Burbank where we're doing a true crime documentary, and it's like, no, nah, nobody really gives a shit about watching that. But like, I will just watch those waves crashing against the cliff for hours. They definitely. Last thing, the, I, when we first go to Nazare, and they're like, 
the reason why this is the best and also the worst place on earth is because there are, contrary to these other places, there are 19 man crushing waves at any moment and they're coming sideways at you and all pointing you into these rocks. And because they're, and, yet, and there's an underwater canyon. So right, yeah. Three miles deep. And yet, being smashed into the rocks immediately is taken off the table as a problem, yeah. which I respect. I don't know how they did that. Chris, you, longtime listeners know you yourself were a lifeguard. You know, uh-huh. you know, you. I saw you, I don't want to, I don't want to brag, but I saw you in a swimming pool this summer and you know your way around H2O. <laughs> you are comfortable and confident. What is your level of like, okay, I could do some of that to, are you fucking kidding me? In Zero. This? Zero percent. Zero percent. I don't love deep ocean stuff. Like right. there was like, like a couple of times when I've been snorkeling and you get really far out there past a reef and you're like, oh, that is eternity. You know, like <laughs> I cannot contemplate like how deep right. and far that is the Pacific Ocean. And like, I will die if I keep going out here. Uh, and it's psychologically more than anything. I just find it terrifying. Those waves would kill us, you know, immediately. Yes. Yeah. Like there would I mean, not be like, oh, cool. Like I get like you saw people trying. They were trying to get back onto the beach. There's some harrowing footage in this show where someone's basically trying to get back on the beach and the tide is just like yanking them back out. So like they'll go in on a wave and be 10 feet from the shore. And then the tide just yanks them back out by like 40 yards. Yeah. And like even when people have and, and that's the other thing, you're towed out there and your choices are you're either going to surf the best thing you've ever surfed and somehow make it out or you're going to wipe out and Wiping out doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do, you know, crazy triple backflip in the air and break your back. Even if you just slip off the board or the wave or the whitewater, the barrel overtakes you, then the next part of your journey begins. And like that's even the people who are survive it are like there's a moment when Garrett is like, yeah, I saw the whitewater coming. So I was underwater for 40, 50 seconds. Like already, I'm like this is this doesn't yeah. seem ideal. Well, that he's like, and he's also like, I get the fear back. That's my thing. Is like, I want to feel like I'm drowning. It makes me they feel talk alive. Talk about the fear. <laughs> God bless these guys. I mean, yeah. I would. I, I think they should just start. Okay, Headspace does very well, but I feel like I just need a motivational podcast from oh, yeah. these three dudes in <laughs> CJ particular. just being like, <laughs> laugh out the trauma, brother. Just keep <laughs> laughing and Cotty like. We talk about how they have the footage of everything, but there's a moment in the last episode where Cotty rides the wave of his life and no one saw it. So yeah, because they were happen? filming like a just, like a terrible accident. Yeah, it's so existential. It's unreal. Um, bravo to all involved. Yeah, including awesome you show. for getting me into this. I love it. Check it out. It's such a great watch. So we'll wrap it up there. We were produced as always by Kaya McMullen. We'll be back on Thursday. Uh, until then, take care. Of the three of us, I think Kaya could surf big waves. <laughs> I, I really right. think that. I think you're right. Yeah. I, I've tried surfing many times in my life and it's uh, never gone well. <laughs> it's because those were small waves, Kai. Yeah, I know. You have to do big waves. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>